Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, this is our third online seminar session and thank you very much for joining today. Um, we have 34 participants till now, which is already an increase again. Makes us very happy. Um, thank you for joining. Um, today we hear something interesting about computational fluid dynamics from Mohamed Sayed. Um, I'll introduce him um, in a minute. First of all, um, for those who already uh, participated last week, uh, two weeks ago, um, we used this thing called Slido. So it's like an online platform where you can post your questions right during the seminar, and at the end you have um, at the end you have a list of all the questions, and then you can upvote the questions that you like. So it's quite easy. You just you can just take your cell phone and go to slido.com and then you're asked to enter an event code which is VAC transport seminar and this is it so then you can write during the presentation, you can type in your, your questions at the end. We can go through all those questions. Yeah. Okay, so here once again is slido.com and afterwards um, the, the event code is VAC transport seminar. I can also type it into the chat in a minute. Okay, and now I'd like to hand over to Mohamed Said our presenter of today. Uh, Mohamed is a PhD student from Paul Jeffrey Institute, PSI. Um, he works in the CFD group from LSM, for, from the Laboratory for Scientific Computing and Modeling. Um, he also serves as like a, a CFD advisor to Swiss Loop. He's supervising a current bachelor thesis at the moment from a Swiss Loop focus student. And He's quite an expert in particle tracking and um, simulation of cl complex turbulent flows. And now I'd like to hand over to you, Mohamed. So, uh, thank you very much, Natalie, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for attending the seminar. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, computational fluid dynamics applications in high speed VAC trains. And the outline of my presentation would be uh, an introduction first uh, to CFD, uh, what CFD stands for, and for those who might not know, and uh, how CFD is used, and why do we use, uh, use CFD simulations to imitate our real life problems. Uh, then I will uh, also uh, quickly show uh, the CFD, the main, the main used, or the, the commonly used uh, CFD methods and approaches. And then I will jump into the CFD applications in real life. Uh, and uh, uh, most importantly, and uh, the most relatable here is uh, the linkage between CFD uh, in Hyperloop uh, applications. Then I will mention some project, uh, uh, Hyperloop uh, related projects and uh, how CFD can uh, benefit us in, in those applications. And then uh, last, uh, I will talk about the credibility in CFD and how uh, would we trust uh, our CFD results, and then I will end my word with the summary. So let's start with uh, with the CFD. Uh, for all of you, you might know uh, what CFD means, but just for the people who are not very familiar with uh, CFD, CFD stands for Computational Fluid Dynamics, and uh, it's basically a branch of fluid dynamics, which employs uh, several numerical uh, algorithms to solve a set of partial differential equations those partial differential equations are uh, very famously known as Navier-Stokes equations. And those Navier-Stokes equations are basically nothing than a uh, uh, momentum conservation equation, as you can see here, and uh, uh, a mass conservation equation. We solve those equations simultaneously on, what's, uh, on something called a grid. And this grid is, consisted of, uh, is consisting of uh, several elements. Each element, uh, for each element we have the solution for the pressure, velocity, and temperature fields uh, uh, in algebraic form. 
Uh, but after this discretization uh, of, of Navier-Stokes equations using some of the pre-specified discretization schemes uh, known uh, as uh, finite difference, uh, fi finite uh, element method, uh, finite difference uh, method, and also finite volume method, but we're not going to dive into those discretization schemes here, just giving you the idea of how generally CFD works. Uh, the last step of the CFD process is to iterate on our solution to have uh, what is called a, a converged solution. Uh, and it, it's quite tricky. We will talk about this in, in several minutes. But after, uh, after having this converged solution, uh, we compare our results uh, versus some experimental data uh, or some uh, uh, higher uh, fidelity data to, uh, have, uh, to have this database. And uh, having, having done so, so we can have uh, what we call simulation-based design. But now, why do we use uh, CFD in essence? Uh, it provides high fidelity databases, which means that we solve, uh, we solve the problems. We, can, uh, we, we have uh, experimental data for of the continuous flow field uh, we encounter in real life, uh, either in academic uh, uh, areas or, uh, or even in industrial sectors. Uh, and then once we have validated our results of the CFD models, we can extend or interrogate other uh, flow cases uh, for which we don't have uh, experimental uh, setup. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very reliable for those cases. And at least sometimes it serves as uh, a rough approximation of, uh, of what we don't know. And we, uh, we barely can have an experimental facility for. And second thing is it's very cost effective and uh, it's even becoming uh, uh, more and more cheaper with uh, o over time since the, the, the first CFD code came out. And this is, uh, I'm, I'm talking here comparatively uh, versus uh, the, the, the build and design, uh, the build and test approach, sorry, which might not be uh, very feasible for some complex uh, flow uh, config configurations. And uh, I would like also to highlight that it's becoming uh, less expensive and uh, more available with uh, ever increasing computational power. I mean, uh, the, the computer uh, power, as you all may know, uh, is, is exponentially increasing uh, since the first computer. And now you can uh, operate uh, most of the CFD uh, problems. Uh, I mean, uh, talking, uh, talking about the simple canonical flows on your personal computer, which was not possible uh, before. So now, after knowing uh, what CFD means, uh, let's just uh, see some of the main methods uh, used to employ uh, this CFD uh, tool into our, our lives. Uh, before talking about the methods, um, I, I would just like to highlight the, the two types of flows we encounter in real life. It's either a laminar flow or a turbulent flow. And uh, the laminar flow is characterized by being fully deterministic. And by fully deterministic, I mean uh, that uh, each of the flow layers are not crossing or mixing with each other. And that's why I'm representing here the laminar flow with two parallel arrows, uh, that they are never uh, cross each other, uh, uh, and uh, even, even in the case of viscous flow, of course. And to better visualize this, uh, you, can, you can see this uh, bundle of, uh, uh, of, of water streaming uh, very smoothly. And of course, it uh, it it um, it consists of uh, of too many sub uh, sub uh, fluid bundles that are parallel together, and there is no uh, friction in between. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, how laminar flow is characterized, basically in a very simple uh, words. On the other hand, the turbulent the turbulent flows are characterized by being completely stochastic and very chaotic. They are uh, very very uh, unpredictable, and uh, uh, what uh, what comes uh, as a prominent feature here on the turbulent flows is mixing. And as you can see, I'm here also uh, just giving a symbolic uh, 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 arrows just to represent that the, the flow layers can cross each other, uh, but they are not deterministic, meaning that whenever we solve the flow, we will never come up with the same trajectories for the flow uh, streamlines. And also to better visualize this, you can see those wiggles of the outflow coming out of the water hose. And um, there are also small and uh, big structures, but uh, this, this is uh, 
uh, I mean, I, we will not dive into the theory of, uh, of, of turbulence here, but just giving you the idea of different types of flows. But it's not the problem only with turbulent flows that they are unpredictable, but also that they have a very vast range of motion scales. And as you can see on this graph, uh, this figure represents the very famous, uh, very famously known uh, as uh, energy cascade curve. And the energy cascade curve represents the, the motion, the turbulent motion scales from the energy containing scales where the turbulent begins until they die at the dissipation scales or the dissipative motion scales. And in order to solve one turbulent flow problem, you have to cover all this uh, and uh, uh, all of those uh, 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 energy spectra uh, containing uh, the energy containing scales and most importantly, the, the dissipative scales. Problem with the dissipative scales that we never, whenever we increase the velocity, those scales get uh, smaller and smaller and this is quite demanding for the computational power. It makes it very, very uh, prohibitively expensive, especially in, 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 uh, in, in some method that we'll talk about now in a minute. Uh, but that's the case with turbulent flow, unlike the, the laminar flow. Uh, it's not only the being uh, stochastic, but also the computational expense. Uh, but anyways, we talk about the turbulence methods, uh, uh, sorry, the, the CFD methods to solve turbulent flows. Uh, which are basically the most encountered uh, type of flows in real life. Uh, over 90% of the flows in real life, the, you know, the, the rivers, the chimneys, the volcanoes, also the smokes. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's all turbulent flows. And we model those turbulent flows with three different approaches, or we solve them, let's say. The first one is RANS, which stands for uh, Ranged Average Navier-Stokes. Uh, and this is a standard approach, which is used basically in, uh, in the majority of the industrial sector applications for its cheapness. But uh, everything comes at a cost because it's the cheapest method. It's, it's also uh, the, the least accurate method because it basically uses time averaging. And without, uh, um, without going into deep details of this time averaging, it's basically uh, that we solve the equations on a bigger time intervals that those bigger time, big time intervals damp the, 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 the turbulent fluctuations. So at the end, we come up just with a gradient-like shape solution, uh, just having an, uh, the upper and lower bounds of the velocity, pressure, and temperature fields without seeing the wiggles that you see here. For example, the flow structures and the flow dynamics are not very prominent. We just see a, a, a faded damped uh, shape of the flow solution and the pressure and uh, velocity uh, fields. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for large eddy simulations, uh, it's a transient approach, it's time dependent approach, and it uses uh, space filtering instead of uh, time averaging. And by this, I mean that we are, uh, we are, uh, we are solving on a, on a grid that, that it's exactly uh, whatever we solve with the grid is uh, the resolved uh, motion scales and uh, what what goes beyond this shift uh, would be a, a model uh, motion scale but um, but anyways it's uh, uh, what i mean by transient approach and from what the name implies large eddy simulations uh, it uh, you can anticipate that it solves very accurately the large flow structures but on the other hand that's not very accurate when it comes to those dissipative scales at the end of uh, this uh, uh, spectra analysis here. Uh, so it, each model of, uh, of RANS and LES has uh, their pros and cons, but comes at the third place, DNS, which stands for direct numerical simulations. This is the most expensive method, but the most accurate one as well, because it solves all the temporal and spatial scales. And in turbulence, if you solve all the scales, you go down to those, uh, uh, what we call Kolmogorov scales. And Kolmogorov scales are case specific, and some problems, it's very, very pro prohibitively expensive to reach such uh, scales. And that's why uh, DNS only serves as a research tool for academia, and uh, it's not uh, really applied in industry, uh, 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 but uh, unlikely RANS is used, and sometimes LES in some projects, as we will see in a couple of slides. Uh, but just to give you an, an impression or a feeling of um, the order of magnitude, uh, one problem that can be solved with RANS in one hour 
it might take uh, one week to be solved with LES and it might uh, take, uh, it will almost take one year solving using a DNS. Uh, that's why, uh, as I said, the DNS is just a research tool. And uh, as, as the matter of any, everything else, whenever we have a, a pros and cons in different uh, applications, we just take uh, the, the, the advantages of each and then combine them into hybrid method. Uh, what is it called here? Hybrid LES RANS models. And uh, very simply, those models uh, engage RANS. I mean, I'm, I'm, spe I'm speaking here specifically uh, in the wall bounded turbulent flows, wall bounded turbulent flows. Uh, we engage uh, RANS near from the wall to solve those dissipative scales, the ones that make our lives um, very difficult. And those uh, also engaging RANS um, gives us or enables us to tolerate much coarser grids uh, in the wall normal direction. And then once we have much, uh, we have enough coarse grid to, sol to resolve the, the local motion scales, we can switch to large eddy simulations. And uh, using those hybrid methods uh, uh, is, uh, is ever increasing in the past few years and it's, giving it, it's showing uh, a great success uh, from the CFD practitioners. Uh, and it's, uh, it might be uh, a, good, um, a, good, a good replacement, I would say. Not replacement, but uh, it's a, it would be a, a very good uh, best practice uh, for, uh, for the CFD analysts instead of solving using large AD simulations. Uh, but yeah, now uh, after uh, having a big picture uh, with what CFD uh, approaches and methods, uh, how can they are uh, applied, we can just move to the CFD applications in real life. Of course, the CFD applications are hundreds and hundreds, but I'm um, just mentioning some, some of them here, uh, what comes to, uh, to my mind. And of course, there are many, many more. But, but just mentioning that uh, it can be involved in large eddies and large scale simulations, like uh, what they call uh, cloud simulations as well. And uh, what you see here is the climate modeling by Los Alamos Lab. This was a project uh, uh, done uh, also uh, by NASA uh, to, to, uh, to have a numerical model for the weather uh, forecast and uh, the climate change. And as you can see, we can see the, the small and big whirls here, but on much, much uh, a bigger uh, microscopic scale uh, to see the temperature field on different uh, parts of the globe and uh, uh, in different uh, times uh, um, uh, across the year. It, uh, it's a big project, and, but, it, but it's not all, only the case that we can solve large scale simulations, of course. We can use it also to solve uh, problems with aerospace industry. This project was carried out, it's CLIMB project, uh, carried out by Airbus. And they are studying the, the effect of the nose and landing, uh, 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 the nose and rear landing gears of an airplane while taking off and uh, and landing. Uh, they are they are studying the effect, the additional effect of uh, of those landing gears, uh, producing an additional component to the aerodynamic drag force on the airplane. And uh, not only aerospace but also automotive. And uh, as you can see, this project was done by uh, Ansys. Uh, they're using large eddy simulations. Uh, also, you can tell from the turbulent structures that we, we don't have a smeared solution. Uh, this is a, a velocity magnitude, velocity field. And what you can see is the flowing flow uh, with the relative velocity between the, the, the vehicle uh, in a stationary, uh, I mean, the moving, the moving vehicle in a stationary uh, ambient. And uh, this, is, uh, this is very useful because we, we can study the stresses uh, uh, from the resultant uh, between the, the lift and drag forces and other, other uh, forces on the vehicle. And then we can uh, predict, uh, uh, we can predict those uh, stresses and the, they are very useful for industry and also to determine the, the, the safety factors uh, during the manufacturing process. It's not only those uh, engineering approaches, but also biomedical approaches. As you can see, this is the Living Heart Project by the Salt Company. And um, uh, this, is, uh, this, was, uh, um, this was representing a blood, um, a blood, uh, a blood uh, circulation in the heart of the human body. Uh, also uh, carried on unstructured grid, as you can see, but it just, you get the idea that we have, I guess, uh, we have. 
something here. I'm just making sure everything going well. Okay. I have to pause this, okay. And uh, it's uh, these uh, biomedical applications. There are many, many more applications also. Uh, but I'm just mentioning, as I said, uh, a few of them here, what, uh, what uh, came in hand. Uh, last time we talked about uh, multi-phase flows. And then multi-phase flows, there is a plethora of applications that can also contribute to, the, to all of the above. Uh, for example, we can simulate the, uh, the, 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 the raindrop formation and growth, which contributes to, to the weather forecasting and the large scale simulations. Uh, we can simulate also the, uh, the, like the, ha the hazards, pollutants coming out, coming out of plants and uh, their effects on the surroundings and uh, for, for air pollution, for example. We can study the sediment transport in the rivers. We can study also biomedical applications again. Uh, studying the, the position of blood cells in the arteries, human bodies. And finally, you can even simulate pandemics like what we have uh, these days. And uh, it's uh, interesting because this uh, simulation was done two to three weeks before uh, uh, it, it was done in PSI uh, by the general purpose codes T, T flows. And it was, uh, it was conducted like three weeks before the coronavirus hit the uh, uh, the outbreak hit Switzerland, and it wasn't in that, intended in, uh, in that way at all. As you can see, we named the particle dispersion prediction study, uh, but you get the idea that we can almost simulate everything using CFD, just knowing the main characteristics of the fir first phase uh, and the second phase or whatever, how many phases do we have. We can always use uh, CFD codes to, uh, to, to solve and imitate our real life problems. Uh, now, we'll, now we'll move to uh, some uh, other applications that we can uh, uh, apply to um, from Hyperloop uh, point of view. And I'm here mentioning uh, three projects. The first one is Nova Hyperloop. This actually was uh, my bachelor uh, graduation project done in 2017. And it was uh, basically aiming at uh, aerodynamic shape optimization um, of, the, of the Hyperloop pod. Uh, as you can see, this is, the configuration of the pod here is uh, is um, uh, uh, is using the, an axial air compressor uh, at the intake, and uh, afterwards we we, we we had a couple of air pumps. The first one bumps uh, the, the 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 one of the air path lines to, towards the the bottom the bottom of the of the pod to have an air cushion to levitate uh, the pod aerostatically and the other one is flowing with, uh, uh, with the rest of the flow coming from the intake all the way down to the nozzle to contribute to the propul uh, propulsion thrust force with the linear induction motor. It was quite interesting to, uh, uh, to, to have this uh, kind of optimization using MOGA, which stands for multi-objective genetic algorithms. Uh, and uh, we used this type of optimization because, because we had a different uh, conflicting objectives because we also had a thermodynamic power cycle. But just uh, talking generally, uh, the big picture was to have a, a good candidate or like the optimum point, uh, which was a trade-off between the power cycle and the, the, the maximum thrust force and the minimum drag achieved on the pod. Uh, and this uh, this is what you see here is the velocity field on one of the candidates on in on 2D case. Uh, and uh, but I mean uh, we we didn't have enough computational resources by the, by the time to solve a 3D case, but it was uh, it was of course an interesting uh, uh, study to conduct. Uh, and uh, then came in 2019 uh, uh, a Swiss Loop project that was uh, done by Natalie Nick, uh, and it was also uh, investigating the aerodynamic shape optimization by using CFD analysis. Uh, and she used for optimization uh, screening method uh, using different geometries and uh, uh, the cost function was uh, to reduce the drag. Uh, here, the, this project was done by Star CCM Plus. Um, sorry, I mentioned, I didn't mention this one. Uh, uh, Nova Hyperloop was conducted by ANSYS. And as you can see, uh, uh, this is the, the last uh, optimum shape of the, of the pod of Swiss Loop. Uh, you can see this, the, 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 the trajectories of the, of, the soft, of the soft air flow field is, is uh, smoothly streamlined on the body. This is after optimization, of course. 
we 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 see i mean we might not see clearly but there are some circulations here but of course this is uh, something that is uh, a must to happen uh, in a turbulent flow field but the, the the main idea was to retard this separation point as as, as much as we can so we can have we can uh, reduce the drag experienced by the pod and achieve higher uh, velocities uh, uh, then um, um, uh, we will talk about taking this uh, aerodynamic shape optimization reduction even a step further uh, talking about the uh, uh, the currently running project uh, by um, uh, Maria Kriner, uh, uh, the bachelor student at ETH Zurich. Uh, it's also a closer prop, uh, program for uh, for her bachelor degree. But just before I dive into this uh, this project, I I'd like to recap that uh, the main idea of uh, the hyperloop to have a partially evacuated tubes, and then we have those capsules running inside. And the main, the main idea of having the partially evacuated tube, of course, is to have low pressure, uh, uh, low pressure conditions. But despite those low pressure conditions, uh, which, which, uh, which contributes to have a, 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 a drastic uh, reduction in the aerodynamic drag force, uh, we still have at higher velocities a rapid uh, increase uh, of the aerodynamic force with the velocity because it, it, it goes, it scales with the velocity square, as you all know. Uh, and um, at the same time, we have a phenomenon that, that it's called a wake flow. And this wake flow is characterized by having uh, a, a, spire, um, um, a swirling motion, sorry, a swirling motion at the rear part of the, of the pod. And this swirling motion is, is also characterized by having an air with turbulent kinetic energy at lower pres pressure. A low, lower pressure than even what what's experienced by the rest of the body of the pod, and then we went uh, uh, even a step further with this, um, trying to or like endeavoring just to exploit this feature, and maybe we can even achieve higher velocities at uh, relatively uh, lower uh, drag forces. Uh, the, for this sake, we. Uh, uh, we conduct the study to, in this project to, to investigate the wake flow effect on several consecutive pods running one after another in, in a specific frequency to obtain a minimum drag force at, at the same time without compromising the safety uh, of the pod. And uh, she's also now, uh, Maria is, uh, is operating uh, with the same conditions as, uh, as it was in the last year's competition, just to imitate the real uh, situation and uh, then she starts with a single single pod uh, measures the drag with uh, with uh, with one configuration and then uh, sends uh, another pod uh, and see the, the, uh, uh, with different distances how uh, how this drag can be affected uh, how can it be reduced and it's just an, an assessment problem uh, where she can investigate the flow in that way so it uh, it's just like a uh, a state-of-the-art type of problems. It's not only these uh, applications that we can apply to uh, related to aerodynamic drag force, I mean, but we can also simulate some risk analysis uh, scenarios where we can also detect with CFD the leakage detection. I mean that we can detect the, the leakage that might happen in the tube uh, uh, with, uh, of course, capturing if we have a, uh, an impulsive pressure uh, pressure increase or lower uh, or velocity decrease at some point, then we detect there is a crack maybe, for example, we, we just um, implement or we construct a, a model where we have a crack and just we see the impact of this before, uh, before the build and test uh, case. Because as I said, of course, it's uh, much, much cheaper. And then we can investigate what can happen in those cases and then we can design uh, our safety measures accordingly. We can also predict the, the shock wave formation before it even happened. And uh, as you may all know uh, about this country with limit, how can we uh, prevent this from happening inside the, the tube uh, while the pods are traveling? Uh, so now I will uh, just last uh, thing I will talk about the CFD credibility after showing the CFD applications, because this is uh, rather crucial. Uh, and I would call it, this is the, the main and uh, the most important step in the CFD process because we might generate a lot of results with CFD and it's, a, it's kind of a joke that it's a colorful fluid dynamics. So it's very, very colorful, but it's tricky because uh, you might have 
the solution converging on the, in the wrong direction. Uh, so just to avoid those situations and uh, we, we have some trust in our results, we go uh, through uh, those, uh, uh, we, we go through this procedure from the American Institute of uh, uh, Astrono Astronautics and Aeronautics. And uh, uh, this, is, this, this is basically followed by every, uh, almost every uh, CFD practitioner. It's uh, just the process of VV or V and V, verification and validation. And uh, verif verification, it's just to make sure that we implement the equations that we want to implement in the right way, debug the code from the programming errors, and that's why we, they call it solving the equations correctly or solving the equations right. And the last step is to validate the problem, and validation is just to make sure that the, that the model's implementation or this mathematical model that we've implemented represents the actual physical problem that we want to simulate in real life uh, and that's why they, uh, they call it uh, solving the right equations and uh, by doing so i guess uh, we should have a simulation based design that we can trust and uh, i will just summarize what we had today uh, so uh, we conclude just the C that the cfd is a very powerful tool as you saw to study different flow, uh, uh, flow, uh, different flow patterns and, uh, and configurations. Uh, also, we can simulate uh, different uh, regarding the Hyperloop project and, and Swiss Loop, uh, 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 which is the most important here. Uh, we can simulate different scenarios where we can design and implement according to our simulations once we have uh, 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 credible results. And we can also simulate risk analysis uh, that we can uh, design uh, also accordingly to those uh, risk analysis, some safety measures that can prevent uh, bad situations from happening before implementing this in real life and going to manufacturing. And the last thing I would say uh, is that uh, always safety analysts are encouraged to build their own codes uh, because it, uh, there is a um, it's it's very challenging when we work with uh, industrial sector. Uh, for um, for instance, because it, the, the 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 cost is sometimes doubled and tripled just because of the licenses of the CFD uh, uh, packages, commercial packages. But when we have our own uh, open source general purpose codes, it's uh, much much uh, lower in cost, and uh, that's why uh, some we need um, more of them like OpenFoam and other uh, CFD open source codes. And I guess uh, that's uh, all I have to share today with you. So thank you very much for your interest and uh, please ask me questions. Thank you for the talk, Mohamed. Um, we appreciate it. Um, it was very interesting. I think we can now switch to the questions people quote on Slido. And for those who still have questions, just type them in and then we can go through them a bit later. Um, okay, so the most upvoted question is, um, will there be a SpaceX Hyperloop pod competition this year? <laughs> um, <laughs> this is what I can't uh, really answer, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> answer it. But I guess you're also um, in the loop, I guess. Um, so this year there won't be a competition. Um, Basically, there are like two approaches. Um, it was postponed by SpaceX before the whole Corona um, pandemic thing started. But even if it had taken place now, I think it could not be held um, due to the Corona pandemic. So no, there won't be a competition this year. Um, we hope there is one next year. We're very positive about it. So SpaceX said they first want to build a larger testing tube for the student teams to participate and yes and additionally um, because we already thought there might not be a competition we um, reached out to other competition teams from Europe and together with Hyped they're from Scotland with Delft from um, from the Netherlands with UPV from Spain um, we planned to do our own event um, which would have taken place in Valencia in July. And unfortunately now it cannot be held due to the pandemic, but 
Also, this is something that is planned for next year. So in the best case, next year we have two separate events. We would have the European Hyperloop Week in Valencia and the SpaceX competition in Los Angeles. So that's the news on Hyperloop events. <laughs> Um, okay, then I go to the next question. Um, don't high-speed trains already have an optimal shape? Isn't it more affordable to copy them? If not, what is the difference? Yeah, of course I would say uh, they are, of course they have optimal shape, but, uh, but the thing is you can't really take the, the geometry as it is and just, op just uh, operate a, a CFD simulation. Because I mean, I mean, whenever you construct uh, a CFD model, you need the geometry, and on this geometry, you you just need a, a design and off design point. So your design point would be exactly the design. I mean, it would it wouldn't be original. You, so you would just conduct the same thing as a replica. Uh, I mean, maybe um, I didn't get the question correctly, but uh, if you, if you mean that we we simulate the same thing that was manufactured before. So it, it's already manufactured. So of course it, it passed by this design phase before it, it, it came out to industry. So um, I, I don't see big point in doing uh, the same thing again. That's why we're like even taking the, the design a step further to, to even lower the drag uh, than the, last, the latest design we had in, in, in a specific field. So. I hope this answers your question. Okay, and if it doesn't, um, just shoot another question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so um, in third place is, is there a problem simulating in low pressure air? Are there limitations regarding media models, temperature or pressure boundaries of the media model? I mean, uh, is it sure? Quite, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what, what do you mean by media models? Okay, so the first, like the first part of the question is, is there a problem simulating in low pressure? So there is no problem if you, if we simulate something. This, this is basically what we do. We simulate uh, in, in low pressure. The, the main thing is we simulate with CFD something that is continuum. So the, the flow has to be continuous. There is no discontinuities in the domain. So once, because once we have a discontinuity, it's a bit hard to describe it in, in, in the, this algebraic discretized form. And I mean, except from the, the, the fact that we can simulate still the, the shock waves, for example, but this would, uh, this would uh, need uh, an additional implementation of what, what is called low Mach number of approach, for example, to make this compressibility effects take into account in the code. But, uh, apart from that, operating on low pressure uh, conditions uh, is, is, is definitely something we can do with uh, CFD, of course, yeah. Okay, next question. Um, what safety measures can be taken against shock waves due to big holes? If, for example, a truck crashes in the tube? Oh, of course, then we, 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 we make another stress analysis for the, for the whole tube because if we have uh, a shock wave because of a, a crack, that means that the stresses because of the uh, outer pressure, the difference between the outer pressure and inner pressure uh, are, are, are overwhelming the, the internal stresses of the, of the tube itself. So maybe the steel is not, uh, the steel thickness is, is, is not enough or uh, maybe the steel grade is, is, uh, is, uh, has some dysfunction, but, uh, but the thing is if, if we have the right quality, of course, then this pressure gradient between outer and, and inner wouldn't overcome the internal stresses of the tube. But uh, uh, I would say the safety measures we can, I mean, uh, we, are, we are just talking about, we make this analysis to take other safety measures. But if we uh, make analysis that we, that mean we construct, we construct a model where we have a crack, where we have this problem. And then we say with this CFD, if we validate this, the, those results, then we say at this threshold or at this uh, pressure difference, if the, if the internal stresses of the tube used in this case is at this limit, then we have to increase it not to have this crack, um, just to, to prevent the, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking generally, but uh, of course the, the structural analysis uh, guys can uh, have a word on this more. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, um, next question. What do you tell some, 
Can you tell something about Eurotube? Can each Hyperloop student team get involved there and get support from them? Maybe this is something Fabio can answer. <laughs> Sure, I'm happy to answer this. Um, of course, every Hyperloop student team and also other companies or other parties part of the vacuum transport family can of course contact us and then get involved in terms of discussion on design, but also later in terms of testing. Uh, here I can refer to the website in other, if needed, of course, also contact me personally, email. Yeah, happy to discuss. Um, the next question, can CFD still be developed further or can we already calculate everything with it? No, no, it's still in development, of course. I mean, uh, CFD uh, still has no ceiling because, uh, as I said, the hybrid models are still evolving. And every day we, we come up with different uh, new turbulence models. Uh, one has uh, more advantages than the other. And most of the turbulence models do not go with all the flow cases we have in daily life, but like majority of them, and then they fail at some, uh, let's say more complex secondary flows, swirling flows, then that what urges us to, to go further. And uh, it's like a driving force for us to always keep working on research, producing more CFD methods. And uh, I guess it's not uh, established and it, it's hard to say it will be. So it's, uh, it's a constant process of uh, development, I would say. Um, next question is, couldn't the drag be reduced further by placing turbo generators on the outer shell of the pots, similarly as on the wings of airplanes? It depends on uh, how, how do you define those turbo generators? If, is it like a, a, an active flow element, active flow control element, that, uh, for example? So if, if we place it on, on the top of the pot, then it might be, yes, uh, I guess, uh, it, I mean, it's hard to tell. It has to be done uh, with a the simulation, then we can judge. But uh, of course, active and uh, even passive flow uh, control is a hot, a hot area of uh, research that uh, it might be very original to come up with an idea like that. It might be a starter for a project. Uh, this is very good. Yeah. Um. How do you decide on the sizes where you take the cutoff for maybe the Maybe quickly, maybe quickly now, uh, not that if we can take the chance, of course. Uh, we can announce also that we have still some open positions or open student theses. Um, and exactly also one of those topics is listed on the, on the list. So if anyone is interested, just shoot us a mail, please submit or apply in the form. Uh, yeah, one of the topics would be on uh, a design of an actual compressor. Indeed. Yes, yes. Um, thank you, Fabio. Um, yes, you can go to um, www.swissloop.ch slash research, where you can find a list of projects. And yes, one with this turbo generator is also one of it. Exactly. Um, so the next question is, how do you decide on the sizes where you take the cutoff for the LES simulation? Is it the size of the mesh? If so, does it interfere with mesh dependence, de dependency test? Uh, this I need uh, some clarification because the cutoff of, of LES, you mean the cutoff of the grid, the, the filtration, space filtration of LES? In the case it's so, it depends on the, on the LES model employed. For example, we have different models of LES, Smogorensky model, the, 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 cl the very classic one, the uh, and then the dynamic one, and then the other ones employed with DES-like models, like the hybrid ones. And uh, uh, we, we decide, uh, for example, let's take, uh, for example, the classic one. We see the, our turbulent structures, and we, we study the, the spectra analysis. And then we see, uh, then, then we say, or we judge according to the project in hand, we say at, at, this, uh, at this size of motion scales, we start, uh, having more interest to show, to show the flow structures. Anything beneath that would, would fall into the SIFT and just be modeled. Uh, and I, I would say it's very case specific uh, for, for, any, for each cut of, uh, cut of length, we just say that the, the LES would stand this way. Because basically, if, we, if you keep refining your grid, you will end up with a cut of length of Kolmogorov, which is basically DNS. 
I hope this answers your question. Otherwise, uh, please uh, ask the question again in the slide. Um, next question is, does the field theory with the Navier-Stokes and also CFD is based on, is valid in a low pressure environment that their air particles are far from each other? Particles? Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not really sure I understand the question, but we said that yes, we can, we can apply any CFD code or, uh, on, on, on low pressure conditions. Uh, this, is, this is fine. But imposing particles in the domain, this is something else because now we don't have a single flow, a single flow simulation anymore, but it turns out to be multi-phase simulation. And in particles, this is, I mean, I would say it's a, a bit bigger story because uh, in throwing or injecting particles in the domain, you have many types of uh, simulations. For one of them, for example, is just a post-processing step. So whenever you solve the flow, regardless of how you solve the flow, how ac accurate or non-accurate you solve the flow, you just throw the particles afterwards and just a post-processing step. You go and trace each, each, each discrete element separately and independently. And then you see, you say, uh, okay, and then I, then I know how does each, each one of them reacts to the flow field and also depending on their inertial properties, of course. But I'm not sure if you, if you really mean this because it's, it's just a separate, uh, I mean, if you combine those, uh, the particle with the carrier flow field, then it would be a multi-phase flow simulation. It's, I'm, I'm not sure if you really uh, mean this, but please clarify. I think here it was more meant or more uh, targeting the actual mean distance, the free mean distance between particles, maybe. I, I don't know. Ah, oh, but yeah. There. Okay. Maybe then this is meant by particles or by molecules. Ah, uh, in molecules, we, uh, I mean, uh, this is uh, 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 what we simulate. Maybe is, is there some, is there some trade-off or some limit? Or at some point, can't we talk of a continuum anymore? Maybe this, this supporting question. Okay. I, I mean, as, as, as long as we, we're solving a CFD problem as a continuum flow, but you're, you're, you're talking about imposing which type of particles or the mean, mean, mean free path of the particles between like different particles or uh, each two successive particles, the nearest ones in the, in the search process, let's say, of this multi-phase flow. Uh, there is no conditions, no, there is no conditions between each part, each two particles, how they would be located from the background carrier flow point of view. But I would say there are other conditions to control how much each particle or how much each discrete phase would be distanced at each time step, not to lose, uh, not to have any dis discontinuity or like uh, infinite acceleration between to its successive time steps from the particles point of view affected by the carrier flow field. And one of them, one of those conditions is called Nyquist control, uh, control condition. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's applied in several methods. One of them is to not to allow the particles to jump or the, any discrete phase to jump between two successive steps, more uh, time steps more than its uh, uh, diameter. But I am uh, really not sure if it answers your question. Okay, so the next question is, um, will Swissloop be a focus project again next year? And so it's very likely that it's going to be a focus project again. The whole application is now dealt, at, uh, dealt with at, at DEMOFT, at, at ETH. Um, we applied to be a focus project again, and it's very likely. I mean, I can't promise every, anything, but it's very likely. Um, the whole deadline has been postponed because of the corona thing. Um, just check our website regularly. We have a, a special site only for Focus Project. It's thislook.ch slash focus minus project. And also when the application form is opened, we will post it on social media and put into our story. So follow us on Instagram and then I guess you can be up to date when, when you can apply for it. Um, Next question is, in which semester can you join Swiss Loop? 
So there's not really like a specific semester from which you can join Swiss Loop. We, I mean, as a, maybe no, as part of the focus project, it's in fifth and sixth semester of the bachelor's degree. Um, we also have master students from electrical engineering and um, mechanical engineering. And of course, we also have other bachelor students in the active team um, during the project year. It's just important that at the beginning of a season, which is in September, we, we form the new team to make sure that we're one entire team for an entire year. So you, you can join during the year. Um, yes, just that to be said. And additionally, from this semester, we launched this Swiss Loop Research where we can give students the possibility to also collaborate and deal with vacuum transportation together with Eurotube, um, where we offer those specific theses, theses um, where you can deal with um, Hyperloop and vacuum transportation. So those are the two options, either to be in the active team, which starts in September, then I would suggest to reach out and apply maybe from May to June. And in order to do a thesis, which can be started like on a flexible basis, it's either bachelor semester or master thesis, you can just feel free to reach out to us and then I'm sure we can find a good solution and possibility for everyone. So those are the possibilities to, to be in touch or to be active with Swissloop. Um, then next question. Um, what is the difference between different CFD programs, for example, ONSYS, Star CCM Plus, etc.? Okay, uh, this is a very open question. Uh, those are uh, all commercial packages codes, uh, commercial CFD packages. Um, might, some of them might be using like different, uh, uh, different grid approaches to like to construct a grid or to convert the grid uh, employed to solve Navier-Stokes equations upon, uh, even from external softwares. And they are also in essence can be different in, 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 in the, uh, the several solvers, uh, silver, uh, several solvers for uh, Navier-Stokes inside each of them. It's not only this, but it also can be uh, one can be like cell-based uh, code and the other can be uh, node-based code. Uh, they, they, might be, uh, they might be gathering uh, most of the features for, uh, for the general purpose CFD code in the market, but they are all like uh, competing to have more features. But it's, it's, it's a bit hard to, to tell because they are, as I said, commercial packages, which means they are closed codes. You can't really see through the lines of the code, but you can just implement your own uh, additional subroutines using what's called uh, user-defined functions. Uh, but uh, on, uh, on the other hand, uh, you can have much more say on that when using uh, open packages, open source uh, CFD codes, like uh, um, TurboFlow, uh, TFlows, and uh, also OpenFoam, and many, many more uh, open source codes. You can investigate and see uh, in each of its subroutines, what's the differences between what, all of them? But most of the CFD codes are uh, serving uh, the same main purpose, which is solving the continuous flow field as a single phase, at least. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're almost done with the time. Um, so we have one last question, and then there's something in the chat regarding the other question. So. Okay. Last question in the chat is um, if it's possible to access the slides beforehand. Um, we didn't do that so far, and I mean, we can have a look at it. And now in the chat, I think everybody can read it, but I can read it out loud. Um, regarding the field theory question, we had a chat around our fluid dynamic team at HOS, HSLU, whether the field theory continue approach may be not valid anymore at high speeds and low pressures because the air particles molecules are too far away, too far away from each other to be, con to be a continuum. So maybe this is like an input for the okay. other. Do you want to state something on that? Uh, I mean, I, 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 I didn't really get it, but is it in the, in the comments? It's in the chat. Okay.
Yeah, this of course this goes uh, in 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 the in the track of having uh, totally vacuum, <sighs> but this is uh, mostly not the case, of course, and we have only partially evacuated tube, which is just operating on lower lower pressure conditions. But yeah, I, I, of course I agree with you. If we if we just talk it uh, talk about it like vac trains, like vacuum trains, and of course vacuum is not continuum anymore. And then we don't have some connectivity between the air molecules. We cannot really uh, simulate what it's uh, really not there. I agree with this, but usually we simulate partially evacuated tubes. Okay, so it's 7 p.m. sharp and we're done with the questions. Um, thank you very much, Mohammed, for the for the okay. We appreciate it. It was very interesting and Yes, thank everyone for joining and for your active questions. It was very interesting to interact with everyone and then we wish everyone um, happy holidays this week and hopefully see you in two weeks um, when, when there's the next seminar. Thank you guys. Thank you, bye-bye. Great evening. Thank you.